thanks Plame for the for the invitation and thanks everyone for being here. It's uh, it's uh, it's exciting to hear. Well, I understand from from one person, but uh, I'll, I'll be curious to hear. Uh, I imagine the the, the audience is uh, is uh, is diverse and and, and different from what the, the kind of uh, of people I generally talk with or talk to. And, uh, and so I'm very looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Uh, let me start sharing the uh, presentation. Uh, I hope you can see it. And mm -hmm. today, as you as you probably know, I'm going to present uh, some joint work with other colleagues, uh, uh, two of which are from uh, LSE and one from Norway, uh, just to, uh, to share the diversity of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of backgrounds. And, and basically, the key point, as you, as you already know from the title, is, uh, is whether there is an urban-rural polarization of, uh, uh, of social values around the world, and especially whether this polarization depends on the level of economic development uh, of a country. Uh, so it's a, in a way, it's a sort of exploratory exercise. It's, it doesn't mean to be causal. We are not play, claiming to find any causal effects, but it's sort of providing a broader picture uh, for polarization along the urban rural continuum across countries. So why this might be an interesting topic? Why this is a, an interesting question? Um, there is clearly, there is a growing uh, uh, discussion about this urban rural gap or this urban rural divide. Uh, this will became in a way apparent, so maybe some of you already uh, knew about it before, but became very apparent in the in the let's say especially after the 2016 election results in the, in the US where this really became a thing that the votes were very polarized along the urban rural axis or urban rural continuum uh, since then there has been a lot of discussion uh, either be with Trump or others for example this is a piece from the FT from the financial times saying that urban rural splits have become a great global divider so in a way, the idea is that uh, uh, while uh, these urban and rural divides are not new really to, if we go back a hundred years, if we talk, look at the commentaries, geography commentaries, hundred years ago, there were discussion about this, but in a way we had somehow these geographical divides in, in political attitudes and outlooks had faded away in favor of other kind of uh, cleavage based on, uh, let's say on class or, or, or other, other things. Uh, this is, a, it's, as I was saying, it's something that has come back to the, to the foreflow or to the discussion. And K, uh, France, for example, is, a, is an exemplary case. Uh, I, I bet uh, um, all of you know about the, uh, about the Gilets jaunes uh, protest in, uh, started a couple of years ago, or, or now a bit more than a couple of years ago. And while the, the, the protest started as, a, as, a, as something related to, uh, to, uh, to uh, fuel subsidies, so something very technical, it quickly became an issue of, a, of a, the rural France or the France outside of Paris revolting against the, 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 the city elites, as it was uh, described. And in fact, this has been really discussed as an as a urban rural kind of protest. Take another a, a paradigmatic example, the US, again, as I was saying about the 2016 elections, uh, but take, let's move forward. Let's take the 2020 elections, so the last uh, uh, presidential elections. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, 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 the election results by county, and you see this map here, uh, this is well, it's not a map I produced, but it's, a, it's, a, it's very clear. There is a very clear pattern of big cities voting for Democrats, and all the other counties, and the, so in a sort of way, it's a, it's a, it's an island of democratic cities, or let's say more progressive cities, or let's say let's not uh, label it, but uh, democratic cities in a sea of uh, of Republican small areas, and this is very clear from uh, from this map. What's interesting is that this uh, this uh, clear association between a uh, party politics or partisanship and, and city size is not something that has been there forever. Like uh, some people in fact claim that this, this has become a, a salient feature since the 60s or uh, perhaps uh, since the 70s. Uh, if you read the, the work by Jonathan Rodden, uh, based at Stanford, we, uh, uh, whom I, I don't cite here, but uh, his work in, in, in some of his work, he, he clearly shows that uh, this uh, association between cities and partisanship becomes uh, 
starts opening up in the 70s and, 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 and evolves over time. Here you see, uh, you see three graphs, very, very clear pictures. You see that if we go around 100 years ago, there is no association between uh, democratic voting and, and city size. Uh, we go in the 60s, we start seeing a sort of association, the, 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 the correlation picks up. We go to the, today or 2016, and there is a very strong association, as you can see from uh, the picture on the, on the left of the screen. So in a way, this is, a, is something, that, this is the, in a way the, the motivation, the driving, uh, uh, one of the driving factors uh, uh, behind the paper. And we know hence that there is a, this, uh, this increasingly distinct urban rural geography in roles uh, across Europe and the US. Uh, we know less on whether this is a global phenomenon or not. In a sense that there, is a, there has been quite a few papers. Uh, I have been written some myself about the uh, urban rural divide in, uh, in Europe, let's say. Uh, but uh, how about other contexts? Is this a global phenomenon, as the FTP was, uh, piece was uh, suggesting? Or is it something like they is pertinent to, uh, to Europe, to North America, uh, to, let's say, the global north, to rich countries? We really don't know. And this is the motivation, uh, or one of the motivations behind the paper. A second motivation, which is perhaps uh, connects to, uh, to the... Uh, to this specific seminar, to maybe to the interest of some of you, is the fact that the cultural values are being seen as the, at, at being at the root of this political divide. Uh, in a sense, so uh, many of these political fault lines are often fought around cultural values. And, and here the idea is that the uh, uh, cultural values indeed have become, in a way, uh, a key determinant in this new cleavage, which is not left versus right, but it's a, let's say, progressive multiculturalist versus, uh, versus nationalist, or uh, define it in, in different ways, but it's a, it's, a, it's a new cleavage very much based on, a, on, a, on values. Um, and clearly, as you will see in the next slides, this is where very much connects to the work of, uh, of, uh, of Inglehart and, and, and collaborators perhaps. Um, interestingly, again, though, there is a little work on whether uh, this uh, growing divergence of values that we see across the US and, and Europe is a global phenomenon or not. Uh, and if yes, or, or if not, either way, can we link it to, can we link these uh, growing divisions to, to modernization theories? So overall, in a way, uh, the research questions that we try to address in this paper are two, and they're very simple questions. Very, very, it's not a rocket science if you want. Uh, so the first question is, is there an urban rural gap in progressive values uh, around the world? And second question, does this gap differ in magnitude? So the size, does the size of the gap, uh, if any, depend on the economic development of a country? So what are the predictions? And here it's, a, I, I'm a, I, I, it's, a, it's something that it's a, I'm very happy to hear your views uh, later on. Uh, but in a way we see, uh, well, we clearly have two main hypotheses. And the first one is that there is indeed a, a gap in, a, in value across the urban rural continuum across the world, in the sense that it's, uh, well, this is how we pose the, 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 the hypothesis. And the idea clearly uh, to, the, or the sub idea, under this hypothesis is there might be some contextual effects of living in cities. In a sense that uh, uh, this clearly goes back to a big question whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's uh, let's say, nature versus nurture, whether there is a, whether, uh, living in a place where the geography matters or not. It's a, it's, a, it's a big debate, for example, in geography. But uh, our underlying idea, and it's something that it's, uh, it's one of the, things that we will, uh, will uh, develop in, in, in future research as well, is that the, there might be some contextual effects of living in cities. In a sense, that living in cities uh, may make the citizens or, 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 or people living there more progressive uh, 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 on different aspects. Clearly here a caveat is that there might be the, the differences that we see across the urban areas and, and the rural areas might just be uh, uh, related to 
composition effects in a sense that the cities often uh, attract different kind of people compared to those who live in the countryside. They generally attract younger, more educated, and, and often more progressive key people. So there, is, there might be a self-selection of people uh, or, or, or more progressive people moving to cities and the opposite moving out of, the, of cities for, uh, for uh, life cycle choices, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second uh, theoretical prediction, or, or, or let's say linked to the, the, our second hypothesis, is that uh, this potential divide that we expect to find becomes stronger uh, at higher levels of economic development. And this is where really where we, we, we draw on, the, on the Ron Ingelhardt's work um, and, uh, and, and, and collaborators. And, and the idea we draw from, uh, from Ingerhals, uh, original work, uh, if we think about the silent revolution, the, the, his book from 1977, uh, about the, this, uh, this uh, scarcity hypothesis. So the idea that, that uh, uh, post materialist progressive values develop where there is, uh, where the, the basic needs, so where the, the most pressing needs are already dealt with. And so whether there is already personal security and it needs in these places where people will have uh, the chance to, uh, to, to, to develop uh, other non-materialist, uh, post-materialist values. Uh, this is a quote that, that probably some, uh, many of you know and probably know more than me. It's, uh, it's uh, from the book of Ingerhart and, and Welser uh, from 2005. And it, it really uh, explores this idea that uh, uh, only when you can take survival, quote unquote, for granted, you can start thinking about the uh, cultural changes that are related to uh, individual autonomy, gender equality, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. It's really at the root of the of modernization theory. Uh, in a way, uh, we see uh, two other hypotheses uh, related to this, uh, to this uh, second, uh, um, two other uh, sub hypotheses related to the to this uh, second hypothesis. So we think about scarcity, so this sort of, uh, let's call it scarcity hypothesis, but we also see a role of socialization. And, uh, and in a way here, we draw in part from, uh, from the uh, later, from the, uh, the latest Ingerhard. So, uh, and, uh, and the idea that the post-materialist value may take time to develop, and, uh, and here is really where we see the, the cities, the role of cities, in the sense that the cities, especially over time, are the places where, which have become more diverse. And these hence are the context in which interaction with the different uh, modifies uh, uh, attitudes. And, and, and so it's a, if there is a socialization effect, we, we expect it to be particularly strong in cities rather than in, uh, in more uh, isolated uh, rural areas. And by the way, I haven't said it, but I, I grew up in the countryside, so it's. Uh, uh, I hope if there is anyone of you from the countryside, that uh, I'm, uh, I'm not talking as a as a as a as a, as a annoying uh, urban uh, citizen uh, complaining about the countryside. This is really like, like observations, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and there is clearly no values attached to to what we are discussing here. There is a final point that we also see that it's uh, of why uh, cities might be the, the beacon of more progressive values, uh, especially at the higher levels of development. Uh, and it's what uh, a person such as um, uh, Alice Evans, a scholar from King's College, uh, uh, London, uh, has recently uh, explored in, in, in a book of hers. And, uh, and it's this organizational hypothesis. And the idea that cities provide better chance for organization, and she explores uh, gender rights, but there is, a, there is also work on uh, LGBTQ plus rights on this issue. And, and, and the idea here is that uh, it's uh, in cities where the fact that there is a sort of critical mass of people interested in, in let's say, pushing uh, progressive right or gender rights or, or any sort of a, a, a specific factor and there is a sort of critical mass and, and so hence there is a sort of a, uh, organizational minimum mass to push forward this, uh, this new, uh, these new instances. Uh, so 
Overall, these are our two uh, theoretical predictions. Um, it's important to stress, I want to say a cautionary note, in a sense that the modernization theory, uh, as it was in the, when it came up in the 50s and 60s, was highly criticized for being uh, overly deterministic, overly optimistic about it, because it felt like it's, uh, we are just uh, uh, heading towards a, a bright future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so in a way, I want to be uh, to uh, to uh, say a cautionary note on the on the on any sort of over simplistic or over deterministic view or approach towards uh, modernization theory. Um, in fact, for example, uh, in our case, we can think of uh, cities not always being so so good. Uh, think about cities; many cities uh, around the world are uh, far from being a beacon of a of a of a progressive values. Cities can be places of, uh, of violence, can be places of, uh, of conflicts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in fact, there is a substantial heterogeneity across countries, and these are in, 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 uh, needs to be taken into account in any sort of a, a cross-country sort of analysis as, uh, such as ours. Uh, importantly also, modernization can go in reverse. Uh, if we read, for example, the work on, uh, on populism, and in particular here I cite the, the book by uh, Ingerhart and Pipanoris from 2017, uh, they clearly claim, and, and, and this is a part of the literature on, on the determinants of populism, that uh, uh, insecurity or security, which uh, is part behind the modernization theory, can go in reverse and can lead to rise of, of a, of a, of a, of a um, more uh, populists call it more uh, political disenchantment linked to this sense of a threat, either be driven by migration, driven by economic crisis, by import competition from uh, from uh, from uh, uh, emerging economies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what do we do in uh, in in, uh, in uh, to to test our hypothesis, uh, we combine two data sets. Uh, we use, we combine the world value survey with a European value study. And uh, we come up, this uh, allows us to, to come up with a cross section of, a, of, of 66 countries. And uh, in particular, we focus on one wave, which is most comparable between the, the different uh, countries, which is a, a wave uh, covering 2017 uh, to 2021. Uh, so, Overall, we, are, we have a, a sample of uh, around 90,000 observations from, uh, you see, uh, from the high income countries, uh, upper income, upper middle incomes and, and lower income countries. Uh, you clearly see that the, the, this, the, the, this, the overall sample is a, it's a over representative of, a, of a high income countries. And this is uh, the best we can do at the moment. Where we, in fact, I'm developing it and I'm, I'm thinking about a new project where I'm trying to broaden the scope of the, of, of the sample to other countries, but for now, this is what we have. And it uh, should anyway give us enough variation at the country level and the country sort of income or level of development uh, to, to explore our hypothesis. Uh, this is just to give you uh, uh, more details about the waves that we have. So we basically use the seventh wave of the World Value Survey and, uh, and the fifth wave of the European Value Studies. Uh, this is uh, the, the countries covered. In case you are you are curious, you see there are countries from uh, a bit from uh, uh, all, all the continents. I, I will show you uh, some maps uh, later on. Uh, so what do we do empirically? So this we uh, this is an empirical paper, as you will see, or is, uh, if you have a chance to read it, uh, to have a look at the draft, and. Uh, what we do is we link, or we regress uh, individual uh, level observations. So uh, for each issue uh, J of person I living in country C, which is the, our uh, uh, outcome uh, vector variables on a set of individual level controls. So the vector X, so X stands for a, a, a series of controls on a, key variable of interest that is uh, it's, uh, its place of residence, which is the beta one mu, which is uh, really our, our main focus of interest. Uh, 
If uh, any of you is interested in technical details, I, I'm happy to provide more. For now, I just want to say that uh, uh, we use a simple uh, ordinary least square regression uh, for simplicity. It's the simplest estimator. It's uh, easy to understand, etc. We run additionally order logic since our outcomes will mostly be ordinary categorical variables. Uh, there is very little difference. We run uh, multi level models, again, no difference, et cetera. So we, we stick to the OLS for, uh, for simplicity, but uh, we have the other models in the, in the, in the, in, in the paper. As I was saying, uh, the youth, so place of residence is the most important variable. Uh, we clearly also include a country fixed effects in the sense that a, a common uh, question mark is, uh, or you may say, well, but the uh, countries are very different. Uh, some countries will have very different welfare states, institutions. So how can you compare, uh, let's say, Norway to uh, Nigeria uh, or Spain to Russia, let's say. Uh, and in a way, it's important to stress that empirically, the inclusion of country fixed effects uh, uh, is, uh, is exactly aimed at addressing this point. So what we do is, uh, is uh, we, by including the fixed effects, we absorb anything that is country specific uh, uh, and, and that will put an alternative uh, bias the results. Um, we also include clearly a sort of controls, the, those you, you may expect, those are, uh, for, such as age, gender, education, income, employment status, uh, immigrant or native status, and, and life satisfaction. Uh, we include clearly post certification weights and, 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 and we cluster error at the country level. Uh, so clearly the, the most important variable in our, in our whole setting is uh, its place of residence. And what we, uh, we can come up with is uh, what we have in these surveys is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a variable that tells us whether the respondent lives in a, in a small place, so it's a place uh, with a population below 5,000 inhabitants, a place between 5 and 20,000, between 20 and 100, 100 and 500, and over 500,000. Um, you can see what's, uh, what's the division of the of a, of a sample in this uh, pie chart. And it's more or less in line with what we would expect. In a sense, we would expect more or less half of the population uh, of the world to be uh, in a, living in, in a urban areas. And this is more or less, uh, or at least our sample seems to be in line with, uh, with our overall expectation. Now, uh, clearly, it's, 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 uh, uh, this kind of classification is, is, is definitely a second best, in a sense that one could clearly argue, well, it's, uh, it's very crude to say that a, a person is, uh, uh, lives in an urban area, if it's in a place over 500,000 inhabitants. These categories may be very different across countries. Uh, Plamen was, a, we had an interaction, an in exchange of emails, and he would say, well, for example, take Japan, where it's a, a Tokyo clearly is very different, let's say, from, a, a, from a Oslo in Norway. And, and one could think about lots of cases where it's a, a, these categories don't fit well to each individual country. Uh, this is clearly a key, a important concern. However, this is a second best. Again, when you do cross-country analysis, you need to, uh, to find a common denominator across all the countries, and this is what we, what we have in the analysis or in the, in the, in the data sets. Uh, to somehow address this concern, we do an alternative, we take an alternative approach and we use the uh, global human settlement uh, data from the uh, European Commission Joint Research Center and basically they use uh, satellite uh, imagery to identify which areas around the world, and there's very micro cells. Uh, I don't remember what's the size, but uh, it's a uh, small cells of let's say one kilometer. Uh, so they, 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 they take the, the imagery across the whole world and they identify which cells are uh, mostly deals, so are mostly urban, and which cells are, uh, are, 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 are sparsely populated. And they come up with a classification which is a, uh, highly urban, uh, semi semi urban, and, and, and rural. Again, this is not an optimal uh, kind of classification, but it's a, it's another second best, which is perhaps more precise of, of our uh, cruder, if you want, definition of what is urban and what is rural. Um, 
as you will see, well, we have this data only for a subset of our sample. So we will base our main analysis on this and we will run some uh, robustness tests using these. Uh, as you will see, the results are very similar in the sense the coefficients will change in magnitude, but the story, the underlying story is very similar. Uh, so the outcome, how, what we try to measure. And here we, uh, we develop a, a composite index. So it's, uh, we draw on the work of Ingerhart and, and we are happy to hear your views on what we do. But uh, we basically decided to create a composite index, which we call index of progressive values based on the, on the different dimensions that we thought uh, would be relevant in this. So we literally took the, 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 the definition of Ingerhart from his uh, seminal book and its values with greater tolerance for ethnic, cultural, and sexual diversity and, and individual choice. So we have three main subcomponents. Each subcomponent then uh, 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 constructed using uh, individual uh, uh, questions from the survey. We have the first component, which we call family like or sex values. And uh, uh, we are happy to hear your views on how to best level it. Uh, I know that some people uh, have suggested us to, to call it, uh, let's say, uh, sexual freedom uh, values, or uh, I'm happy to hear your views in the Q&A. But it's basically, uh, this first pillar is, uh, is built on questions on uh, tolerance to abortion, homosexuality, prostitution, divorce, divorce euthanasia, and, and casual sex. Uh, all of these are, are measured on a, a Likert scale, one to 10. Uh, so you see that it's, a, it's a categorical variables. We then have a separate com component, which is uh, linked to gender equality. And here we have two questions uh, from the surveys. Uh, the first one is men, men make better politicians, and uh, the second, men are better in doing business. Uh, here, the, the, the scale is one to four, and hence we will rescale all the variables in a, in a similar way. And the final uh, dimension is uh, linked to immigration, so to, let's say, uh, cultural diversity, if you want. And, uh, and the question is, uh, jobs should be prioritized for nationals? And what is the impact of immigration on the development of, of, your, of your country, so the respondents' country? Uh, so effectively, what we do is we average uh, uh, the, 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 um, the, we combine the subcomponents and we rescale the, the scale of each variable so that each of them match the zero to 10 scale. And we, we combine them in a, in a, in a um, averaging uh, all the responses cre and create this uh, overall index. To give you an idea, this is how the index look like or the distribution of the index look like. Uh, as you will expect, there is clearly like uh, higher uh, countries with a higher, let's say, human development index, higher GDP also tend to have a more progressive uh, values. You see Scandinavia, uh, you see you, continental Europe uh, with respect to, uh, to other contexts. Uh, but let's move on. Let's think about the, uh, the, the gap, the progressive value, the gap, so the link between this, this index and the, and the urban rural divide. Um, if here I'm plotting the, the gap in values between places with a higher or lower degree of urbanization. And uh, in particular, I would like to draw your attention to the, uh, to the, uh, to the graph on the lower right hand of the, of the screen. And clearly this is a, just a bivariate correlation, but we do see, seem to find a, a, a link between the urban rural gap in progressive values and GDP per capita in a, or, of the country. So we do, at least at the anecdotal level, we start to see a sort of correlation and start to see evidence in favor of our second hypothesis which will be testing more depth in the, in the regression analysis, which I'm going to show you. Uh, here, some descriptive statistics. Uh, I will skip them, but I'm happy to come back to these in case you have doubts about the uh, statistical property of our uh, variables. It seems that uh, more or less is, uh, everything's fine. Our progressive values has a mean of more or less five and a standard deviation of uh, below two, so it's a uh, uh, it's not overly skewed, uh, and, and so are the other variables. 
let me jump to the results and I, I'm reaching the end of the presentation, so I'll be faster from now on. Uh, as we will expect, and clearly as uh, I build up the story, we do find the strongest significant difference here between cities, between the large cities, which is the baseline category. So cities with a population above half a million are the baseline. So this coefficient tells us how a, an average respondent living, let's say, in a medium city, so between a, a city of a 10 to 500K, uh, compares to a, a, the average respondent living in, a, in, a, in the top category, which is a city is above uh, half a million. Uh, you clearly see that there is a statistically significant difference. And, and interestingly, this difference increases along we go down on the urban-rural continuum. So, Residents living in urban in rural areas, so the lowest category, have a, a, an average difference holding a cost and all other factors um, bigger compared to residents living in towns, residents living in cities, etc., which is exactly what we would expect. Uh, Interestingly, clearly the, mag the, the gap magnitude uh, decreases after we include uh, uh, individual controls. So uh, in a way, if, uh, if our story was about the composition effects in the sense that this difference, these crude differences are just driven by a different composition of cities versus the countryside, we would expect this, uh, this, uh, this uh, urban rural gap to reduce. And this is what we find. However, it's important to stress that this urban rural gap remains uh, significant and quite large, even once we control for these uh, key uh, social demographic controls. So if we look at column four, where we control for uh, economic individual characteristics, uh, demographic, key social demography, et cetera, the size between the urban and rural areas decreases, but is still very, very strong. Uh, to give you an idea, here I'm splitting the, uh, the, the results, so the overall index, and I'm just plotting the, the main coefficients, uh, splitting the, our main index of progressive values into these three components. And uh, you see that the, the biggest difference is driven by the, what I call family values. Uh, immigration attitudes are also quite uh, significant, but the, uh, the, the size is much smaller compared to the family values, which is really what seems to be driving our main story. Uh, if you are curious to, uh, to hear what are the effects of the other covariates, so in the regression tables, I was always showing you the urban rural uh, variable, but uh, here I'm plotting the, the size of the regression coefficients of, the, uh, of our urban run values and compared to, to the other key social demographic characteristics. And uh, for example, as you would expect, you do find, uh, we do find that uh, let's say tertiary education is a, a very strong predictor of, a, of, a, of a progressive values. You see uh, tertiary education down uh, in the lower half of the, of the, of the variable list is a is much stronger predictor than let's say than being in a rural area. Um, same story, income seems to be highly correlated to more progressive values. However, it's important to stress that despite these, the size of the urban rural uh, 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 variable is still uh, quite significant, even in absolute, like it, it's meaningful. It's not only statistically significant, but it has a, is a, 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 a big size. Importantly, also that uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, conceptually education and income might be back control. So here I'm showing you what happens to the urban rural uh, divide uh, when we control for education, income, and, and the full list of covariates. But uh, in a way, this might be back controls because this education and income might somehow be channels through which uh, urban or city size influence individual attitudes uh, because people in in larger cities may be. Have, may have better access to education, may be, uh, have a, a better ways to, to achieve higher income, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to go to quickly, to, uh, I, I want to show, uh, I'm aware that I already uh, gone over half an hour, so I will show you quickly a, a set of robustness checks. Uh, here I'm presenting the results of, uh, of the, when 
using this alternative uh, um, uh, approach using the, 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 the global uh, human settlement layer from the uh, European Commission. Uh, so this uh, satellite uh, imagery approach to, uh, to define what is urban and what is rural. And we, we see that the results are, are, are overall similar. In a sense, we still see that uh, rural areas have a, tend to be less progressive uh, compared to, uh, to uh, uh, highly urban areas. Uh, similarly, I want to show uh, my final results. So I'm reaching the end of the presentation. Uh, what happened when we try to address uh, hypothesis two? So, so far I show you that there is a, an overall difference across the world in progressive values between urban and rural areas. But uh, I want to show you one more thing in this. Is this difference determinant or is this difference linked to the, the level of of, of income in countries, which is sort of a proxy to test for the uh, uh, Ingerhardt hypothesis of a post-materialist thinking emerging in places where there is a economic security. And we do seem to find uh, uh, supportive evidence. So here, what I'm doing, I'm presenting, again, the main results, uh, splitting the samples or stratifying the sample into three groups. So high income countries, upper middle income countries, and low or lower middle income countries. And what we find is that uh, indeed, as we uh, would have expected from a uh, hypothesis two, the gap is higher in, uh, in high income countries. In fact, uh, you see the magnitude, the size of the coefficient, if you compare, let's say, column four and column uh, six, becomes smaller compared to the magnitude in, in, in column two, and importantly, become also uh, almost insignificant in, in the last model, once we control for individual characteristics. Uh, here, I'm running, I'm doing the same, I'm testing the same hypothesis, doing a slightly different approach. So here, I'm, I'm adding an interaction term, so I'm not slicing out the sample into three groups, but I'm keeping the samples, the world samples together and adding an interaction term between uh, uh, the place of residence and, and, and country level of income. Again, uh, we do see that, uh, uh, as you would expect, that the urban rural gap is uh, strong and becomes only significant in a high income country. You see the interaction term, so the lower uh, red uh, square box is a, shows us that the, the, the interaction is significant only for high income countries. So to sum up, uh, what we find uh, in this paper and what I'm trying to argue is that there is indeed a significant gap in, uh, in progressive values between urban and rural areas and rural places across the world tend to be more conservative on all dimensions, especially on, on family values. Uh, Importantly, the gap is also larger in high income countries, as I should try to show you in the last slides. Um, now, is this all driven by composition effects as uh, people such as uh, Rahan Maxwell in a famous paper in the American Journal of Political Science from a couple of years ago was arguing, or is there is also a contextual uh, effect of places? Uh, we do find indeed, in line with Maxwell's argument, that uh, uh, the geographical dimension is less re relevant than key composition factors. So these uh, crude differences that we find between urban and rural areas are indeed explained by some composition. So by the different uh, distribution of places with the, or, of people with different characteristics uh, across, uh, across different areas. Nevertheless, even when we control for this uh, important key composition effects, the role of geography remains, remains strong. Um, to give you an idea, uh, the level of, uh, of education uh, uh, is, is higher than the level that, that then be, or the if effect of, of higher education is higher than being in a rural area compared to a city, but is not, uh, uh, is, uh, the, 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 the geographical determinants remain anyway, a very important, term, a very important component. Um, with this, I conclude. Uh, thank you for your attention, um, and uh, I look forward to uh, to this for the discussion, to your uh, questions, suggestions, etc.